Hello and welcome to the replay. I'm Jason Butler and I'm a personal finance expert, 30 years experience, uh, God knows how many qualifications and a lot of real experience of working not just on my own affairs and my own situation but also over the years working with many people, many families uh, and many situations. So um, yeah, um, the last live of 2020 um, started doing this. Hello everyone, yeah, good to see you there. Nice to see some returnees, which is good, and some people who've uh, been on before. Um, it's been an interesting year, hasn't it, 2020? And I've done, you know, obviously a number of these lives now. Instagram was a new medium for me. Uh, I've been around a long time. But um, I've really enjoyed, um, I've really enjoyed interacting with people on Instagram and I've really enjoyed doing these lives and if they've helped you please tell others um, if you want me to cover other areas for next year please let me know um, and um, in terms of today's session this is all really a Q&A that's all it is so I've got quite a few questions that already come in uh, both over Instagram and also from my website uh, I get asked lots of questions um, hi Peter good to see you um, and um, what I want to do today is I just want to get through as many questions as I can. Uh, now, you've got to remember, I'm not giving personal financial advice and your situation may mean that you need to take personal advice. But, you know, what I'm going to tell you is what I would do if I were in your situation. And I would share with you my insights, my beliefs and my ideas. And uh, if you've not already checked them out, then um, uh, then basically do check out my eight money milestones um, on my website jason-butler.com because that's the framework which I use but I've got a lot of beliefs I've got a lot of attitudes I've got a lot of insights that you can tap into so look I'm not saying I know all the answers I'm not saying you need to do everything I say but what I want to do is I want to share with you wisdom that I have learned over 30 odd years so let's get into if you want to ask me a question by the way um, live tonight go into the question box chuck your question in and I will try and answer as many as I can in the next 28 29 minutes and bear in mind there are no silly questions okay it doesn't matter what it is if it's a financial related one I can't answer things like the meaning of life but if it's a financial related one um, anything to do with a, a money um, related question then do let me know Good to see you. Hi, there's uh, Tobar. It's good to see you again. There's quite a few people, um, a lot of people joining who've been on before, so that's good. I'm really heartened there. So let's get into these questions then. Now, I've got to put my um, my um, glasses on because I'm blind as a bat. Um, right, this one is from um, Scott Lawrence. Right, so how would you spread £1,000 savings per month between investing, pension, premium bonds, etc.? Okay, well, here's the thing. The, the, how you need to spread a £1,000 of savings will really determine, determine by where you are in the money milestones. Um, so I'm just going to share that one with you so you can see that question. That's from Scott. Um, it really depends. So if you don't have an emergency saving funds, you need to build up your first 1000 quid. If you've still got debts, you need to get the debt snowball and get rid of that. Um, and as far as it comes to, um, once you've got rid of debt, then you can start thinking about allocating it to other things. So once you've got rid of your debt, you then want to start building up emergency savings to at least three times your core core living costs. But assuming you've done that, then you need to look at the other steps, which is are you putting 15% into um, for longer term investments? So uh, the tax wrapper you use will probably be a pension, um, but it will also potentially, it's not just the tax wrapper, the reason why pensions often come up first is because they get an employer contribution um, and they, they benefit from an employer contribution, which obviously makes sense, it's free money, but also they get tax benefits. But the tax wrapper, let's put that to one side, the key is to be investing in real assets, so that's, um, that's primarily going to be equities if you've got a 30, 40 year time horizon. Um, but I also, once I've got that sorted, I'm then looking to try and get rid of the mortgage. And when I had a mortgage at one stage, I was overpaying the mortgage at £3,000 a month. Okay, That to me, overpaying my mortgage early, getting rid of it early, was the same as risk-free, tax-free savings, assuming you got everything else sorted. So that's how I deal with that one. So let's uh, finish that one. Um, that's a good one. Um, we got one here from Peter. Uh, if you pass down an asset to your children, what are the tax implications to both parties? Could you break this down, please? Right. Well, Peter, first and foremost, if you pass an asset to someone um, and it is an asset that has a capital gain in it, so it's not cash, uh, say it's a property or it's an investment, 
um, and it's not inside a nicer account, then, then the moment you gift something to someone, that crystallizes a capital gain. Now, I'm not a tax advisor, but basically that's a tax point. That causes a capital gain. There are ways you can avoid that capital gain, um, and, and one of the ways you can avoid that is by gifting the, tr the asset into a trust, normally a discretionary trust, um, and then making and then you the trust can distribute the item out to the person um, uh, and then they take on the base cost so that's one way of it's, it's basically called holdover gift holdover uh, it's a complicated area so if the asset is big if it's large if it's within your personal capital gains tax allowance which is just over 12,000 quid then there's not going to be a problem if you haven't made total gains in that year so you're always best off if you can giving money either from a tax-free account like an ISA if you're going to draw money and then give it to someone um, or within your annual gift allowance so you can make up to three thousand pounds a year annual gift within inheritance tax that's immediately out of your estate so assuming there's not capital gains tax on giving the asset the implication for capital gains uh, for inheritance tax really depends on the, the value of your overall estate and it's quite complicated but essentially if you own uh, more than 325,000 quid, excluding property, then anything over that potentially is subject to inheritance tax. It's gonna be very difficult for me to explain that on this live, Peter, um, but essentially look at this. Most people can give away anything they want in their lifetime to anyone else. As long as it's not an asset that has a capital gains, there'll be no immediate tax. They could use a trust to hold over that capital gain if they wanted to, to that person, so the person took on the capital gain. But for inheritance tax purposes, as a general rule, you need to live for seven years if you're giving a gift to someone, absolutely, okay? You need to live for seven years. And then what happens is it's added back into your estate if you die within seven years as if it's never happened and pushes the rest of your assets up. If you give an asset, a gift to a trust, that's different. There's a different set of rules and it can be up to 14 years you have to wait. It's quite complicated. I'm sorry I can't answer that one particularly, okay, but most people can give money out of their income and it's always out of their estate immediately. So I'm hoping that answers your um, your question there, Peter. If, there's a, if you want me to fine tune that, ask another one and I'll get to that if I can. So let's have a look at here. This is a question uh, that which came in um, uh, earlier, if you can all see that. Um, which Daisy's uh, collated for us. That's my daughter Daisy. Um, this one came in from someone who asked, what's the most powerful thing you've learned about selling a business? Well, well, let's think about that. I have sold, bought and sold um, two or three businesses. But the, the most powerful thing that I learned about selling the business that I ran for 17 years, my wealth advice business, was um, was basically that your business, if you have it for a long period of time, can become very much part of your identity. And you can over-associate your identity with your business. Well, here's the thing. Your business doesn't really care about you, okay? Your business, you're only there all the time it suits you. Um, and from my point of view, my business had started to own me rather than me own the business. So the most powerful thing I learned about a business, selling a business, is that you should always have your business ready for sale. Not always for sale, but ready for um, sale. Thank you, Finance Freedom Future. That's very kind of you, very nice of you to say. Um, from my point of view, a business should always be sale ready, which means that you should run it and you should know what it's worth, you should know who you might sell it to, you know what price you would take, you know how you might structure the deal. So the thing that I learned was that the one thing that we'd never done in my business, and it was a squeaky clean, very well run business, we had not got round to the valuation metrics for the business and how one of the owners would exit. And I was the youngest one, so it was assumed that I would be there longest. But when I finally did want to get out of that business, it was absolute hell agreeing a value agreeing a payment schedule and agreeing a risk and return for me. So um, as far as I'm concerned, um, really knowing how you're going to get out of your business is just as important as getting into it. And that's something I ask all the people who um, ask me to invest in their businesses. I want to know what's the exit route, who are you going to sell to, what do you think the multiple is, and what will affect that, that sell value. Okay. And another thing I also learned from selling a business is that when you sell a business, you are merely selling... Um, you're merely selling the future income from that business and the future growth from that business. And some of it has to go to the seller uh, and some of it has to go to the buyer because obviously it's all about, price is all about risk um, and reward. So if the price is very high, 
then they're going to want to take risk off the table. If the price is very low, you have to avoid any warranties. Uh, I can do a whole session on selling businesses, and I will do one in the new year because I think there's a lot of stuff there to be thinking. What's this one? House of Hearse. I've got one here that's just been chucked in. How long did it take you to pay off your mortgage and did you reduce the 15% contribution into your pension? Uh, no, I haven't reduced the, I never reduced my, uh, in fact, I put my contributions to my pension up. Um, it's a long story really because I, I had, I got my mortgage down quite a bit and then I had business problems and then my, my mortgage ballooned and at the highest level my mortgage got to £580,000, which for me was a lot, okay? Um, but no, I, I, I basically did it in chunks. I did, I overpaid it, but as soon as I had lumps of money and I sold things off or I had a result or I had a capital event, I just chucked it into that mortgage and got rid of it. And then my final part of the mortgage was I had it on an investment um, property and I just decided I don't want debt in my life anymore. I had the money in the savings account. I took it out of savings and paid it off. And it coincided when rates started falling a couple of years ago, really started falling down. So, so it was a mixture of overpaying, lumps of money. And that's a very important point. When you get bonuses, when you get windfalls, when you get inheritances, you know, just chuck it off the mortgage. Assuming you've got milestones one, two, three and four done and, and you're on to five, is, is paying off the mortgage is, is a risk-free tax-free return. Now, sometimes you might not want to pay off the mortgage, you might want to start a business, you might need that money. So there are all those reasons, but it's not to say that you only pay, pay down the mortgage, you do it in concert with other things of your, your, your contributions towards pension and retirement and um, building other savings outside of pension wrappers. Um, right, here we go. Peter's asked me a subsidiary on that question about inheritance tax. What was that point about seven years? Right, Peter, the, the point is this, is that if I give an asset away, I have to live for seven years, otherwise it's added back into my estate if it is not within my annual gift allowance of £3,000. And if I didn't use my gift allowance for the previous year, I can use that as well. So I can make a contribution, I can make a gift to any one person of up to £6,000. If I didn't make a gift last year, that's £6,000. Um, but if it's bigger than that, I've got to live for seven years. Otherwise, the gift that I gave, say I gave 100000 to Daisy, right? say I was feeling generous, I would have to live for it was 100000 less two gift exemptions this year's and last year's, that's 94,000 that would be added back to my estate as if I'd never given it away for the purposes of working out if I owe inheritance tax to the inland revenue. So that's what it's called the, the seven year survival rule. Okay, so let's have a look at another question here. Um, what we got here? Um, now this was, um, what advice could, oh, let's put this one up. Um, Daisy got this one sent through earlier. Someone um, sent this through. Um, can you give advice on saving for a child's future? Right, okay, yeah, we'll give some advice. First and foremost, the best thing you can do for your child's future is to be a great role model, okay? That's, and you think I'm being a bit sneaky or a bit crass, but be a good role model. Get your own affairs in order. Make sure that you uh, are organizing your affairs properly and get yourself through milestones one, two, three, and four. Now, regardless of where you are in the milestones and regardless of uh, where you are personally, what you want to do is make sure that you start, if you can, save something for your children, okay? And I'll come back to where in a minute, but save something. So look, for instance, we always used to save the child benefit. So the child benefit came in and we were fortunate, obviously when we were really up against it many years ago, we needed to use it to buy food. But once we got past survival mode, we always said that the child benefit money was always for our children. Uh, it was always for our children. So we would always put that aside in what used to be at the time junior, uh, what were they called now? They were called child trust funds. And before that, there was nothing. There was child trust funds, 2003, 2004. And then they brought out junior ices, didn't they? But before that, I just used to invest in into, at the time, uh, a big investment trust for, for Daisy all those years ago. I used to do a regular contribution before they had special accounts. So we always saved um, the children's um, child benefit. And then obviously, as we started earning more money, we started putting more money aside into that. And we... Now, you know, if I was starting out again, I'd be using the junior ISA account, not for huge amounts, but for modest amounts. Because one of the things to bear in mind with children is that if you start saving into a junior ISA account or into an investment trust or a unit trust where you, you designate your name, you know, you hold it as a trustee for them, is they're going to get that as of right at 18. And that's great if they turn out to be level headed and organized and sensible. Um, but what if they become a um, you know, sort of irresponsible. And one of my good friends, he was doing that. He was saving into a, a, um, 
uh, an ISA for his son, junior ISA. And uh, he got to 18, didn't even ask his dad, just cashed the thing and went on a road trip in, in America. But 18, didn't even ask his dad, it was about 15 grand, just gone. Now, I know he had a right to do it, so be careful. It might be better for you, particularly if you're saving more modest amounts, to save and invest into a, say, a global index fund in an ISA in your own name, particularly if you're only doing modest amounts of, say, you know, a couple of hundred is, you know, that's the most you can do, that's sort of two and a half, three thousand a year. And you can then decide when they get to 18, 19, 20, if you want to give them some of that money. Now, I know it's going to be in your estate for inheritance tax, but for most couples who own a property, you're not going to, you're not even got an inheritance tax problem unless you've got an estate more than a million pound. So I would be a good role model. I would make sure my own affairs are in solid uh, fashion. I would be investing either uh, within my own um, individual savings account in a global uh, equity uh, index fund um, and, and, and give the child some money when they're older if I want to have total control. Or I would direct uh, certainly their child benefit money and possibly a little bit extra into their junior ISA if I was comfortable that they were going to get their hands on it when they were 18. So, so that was that one there. So that's an interesting one. Okay, um, now another one here that we got came in was uh, what's best, a LISA, a lifetime ISA. So anyone who's not in the UK, I'm sorry, but these are UK accounts or an individual savings account. Um, well, here's the thing. If you are under 40 and you've never bought a house before um, and you're a basic rate taxpayer, um, a LISA is kind of like a pension with loads of flexibility that can enable you to A, use the fund to buy a house, um, in which case you know, you'll keep the government bonus that they've added to your contributions. Or if you get in a pickle and you get real problems in your life and you can't buy a house and it's before you're 60, you can take the money out, but there is a penalty which kind of acts against you. It means that you've actually lost money, even if the the investment hasn't changed you've actually lost money because the government take a bit more than the bonus they gave you so a LISA is pretty good for people who aren't sure whether they are saving for retirement or buying their first home and if they're under 40. An ISA doesn't have the benefit of a bonus added on the contribution so a LISA if you put 4,000 in an ISA, LISA it becomes five grand okay and you only keep that bonus if you use it to buy your first home or you use it when you're 60 to provide you with retirement income. OK, they take it back if you take it before. Whereas NISA doesn't get any bonuses added, but it grows tax free. You can take it at any time. And here's another little thing with an ISA. A lot of people don't know if your ISA provider is a flexible ISA provider, then you can take money out of the ISA and put it back as long as you put it back in the same tax year and you won't lose your tax benefits. So say I want to say I've got a million pound in ISAs and I just need to take 900,000 out to to cash flow a mortgage deal. I can take the 900 grand out, cash flow my mortgage deal in September October as long as I put that 900 grand back in my flexible stocks and shares ISA before the 6th of April next year. I haven't lost any of my allowances, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. That's a good thing with a flexible stocks and shares ISA. So um, an ISA is good for those people who either aren't going to get the benefits of a LISA, they're over 40, or have already bought a house, so it's not really going to help them, um, um, or don't want to be restricted to only using it when they're 60. Hopefully that's answered that one there. Um, hopefully that's a good one there. So let's have a look at what else we got here. Um, Oh, I answered that one, didn't I? How long did it take you to pay off your mortgage? Did I answer that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got another one here. Um, how should I invest my pension fund? Right, so let's just think about this. Um, most people will have some form of pension fund, whether it's through their workplace, from their job, or a self-employed personal pension. And if they don't, they should have one that, right? So here's the interesting thing with uh, your pension fund. Even if you don't have a lot of savings, even if you've still got a big mortgage, even if you're still trying to pay off non-mortgage debt and get yourself sorted, you'll still have some money invested in a pension pot somewhere, even if it's the minimum contributions from your employer or something you did a few years ago and you had a few more quid. Someone, everyone's got a few grand sitting around in a pension fund. But it doesn't matter how much is in it or how much is putting into it, you should take as much attention about where that money's invested. Right, so here's things to think of. If your time horizon is really long, which most people it is in their pension fund, they can't touch it until they're probably 60, most people, or even later for most people, and you're 30, you've got a 30-year time horizon, right? 
So if you've got a 30 year time horizon, then probably you want to you want to be thinking, I want a large predominant amount of my pension fund invested in global equities. The exact amount is down to you to determine. Personally, um, you know, I have 100 percent. I invest 100 percent of my contributions into global equities, but I've recently reduced some of my my existing because I've got a significant pension pot. So I've reduced I've removed some of my pension monies and put it into index linked gilts. That's purely purely because I'm getting nearer to the limits for lifetime allowance. So I don't I don't want my pension fund to be you know massively going beyond what the government will allow because I'll get taxed. I'll get penalised on that. But if you're well within the sort of the million pound plus limit that they give you currently, then you want as much growth as you can. And the asset class, which has historically given us the most growth, is investing in world class companies. Um, and the simplest way of doing that is at a global equity index fund. Any other investment solution should be compared against that. So if it's a workplace pension, so I have a workplace pension through salary finance, who I work for part time with legal in general. They have equity, global equity index fund. Cheapest chips, you know, I don't even know if it's 10 basis, you know, a tenth of a percent. I'm not using any active, uh, actively managed funds because they're too expensive. I'm not using any lifestyle funds. I'm not using any funds that are going to study, start reducing down when I get to retirement because I want to control it. So I would, st I would predominantly be putting my contributions predominantly into global equity index. Now, if you are concerned about sustainable investing or ethical investing or sus anything to do with that, then you can invest in a... ESG type thing, environmental, social, governance type fund, or a sustainable fund, which is an equity index fund. It just has, um, it just has um, a different set of rules that that screen some companies in and some companies out. So it's still an index fund, but it's got that sort of governance. And there are, there is research that says that um, companies that you know, um, have very high what's called ESG levels, so they're very high on environmental, social, and governance they should have a higher expected return in the future because they're avoiding doing all the sort of nasty stuff and they tend to have more diverse boards and make better decisions and avoid silly takeovers and, and doing stuff that's uh, not sustainable. So Global Equity Index Fund is your, is your go-to. Compare everything else to that. Um, you know I love Vanguard. I'm not saying go to Vanguard, but you've got LNG, you've got State Street, you've got BlackRock. Um, all of those good guys, look for them. You can do a Google search on that and find it what you want. But you know, for me, I love Vanguard. I've used them for years. I like them. Um, yes, I know there are other providers. This is not financial promotion or recommendation, but that's what I use. So I'm just telling you, right? Um, so hopefully that basically you should invest your. The thing is to get as much into your pension that you can afford. The early contributions make you the most money. Go for the asset, which is the most risky, but it's unlikely to give you a complete loss of. It, uh, capital. It's, it's going to go up and down, but that suits you when you're saving regularly. If you're getting nearer to retirement and you're going to have to start drawing on that, that's when you want to start thinking about de-risking, which is why I've got index link gilts in my, my pension portfolio. I've got a significant exposure there because I just want to immunise myself against inflation in the future. I don't really want any growth on that money because I'm going to get penalised. Um, here we go, Jason. This is one from Simply Budget. I'm going to answer you this one. Um, if I wanted to move my workplace pension into an index fund, will the pension provider allow me to do that? Well, Simply Budget, it depends on your provider. Most pension providers have low cost index funds. OK, um, it's just that the, you, the, most schemes are set up. So there's a default. If you didn't make a choice, they put you in a default, some smelly managed fund, which costs you one percent a year. And that's just robbing you. OK, no, I'm being unfair. Um, probably half a percent, 0. 0.6, but it's still too much. So most companies, LNG, Scottish Widows, Standard Life, um, Fidelity, uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne, all of these companies have got a range of index funds. So just compare what you're in and you can do a switch. Normally these can be done online. You can do a switch of both what's in the fund and future contributions. And if you don't want to change what you've got, just redirect future contributions. Um, oh, hello, Madeline. Didn't notice you there. Um, got a question here from Madeline. Would you recommend those companies for combining pensions over Pension B or Penfold? No, no, I've got, look, um, Pension B, Penfold, I'm sure they're all lovely people. Um, you you go with whoever you, th you feel comfortable. Look, let's face it, whether it's Pension B, Penfold or anyone at like AJ Bell, it's just, look at, they're all a much a muchness. You're not getting any advice with it. All you're looking for is fair cost. You don't want to pay any more than you have to. Brilliant interface that is nice to use and you can get in and change things. And decent information. That's all you're looking for. So look, Pension B are good people. I've met them. I know they're nice. Um, AJ Bell, all those kind of people. Um, whatever whatever suits you. Um, let's have a look here then. Um, 
House of Hearst, I've got a question. Let's just sorry, let me just have a look at the other questions. Then we've got another one here. Um let's have a look. Uh right, this is a good one from Peter. Um would you discourage investing in emergency fund insurance over building the cash reserve yourself? Mm, not sure what that means. Um would you discourage investing in emergency fund insurance over building the cash reserves yourself? No. Uh, no, I wouldn't buy, be buying insurance other than income protection insurance, life insurance, and the insurance that I need on my car and my house. No, um, your emergency fund is the insurance, okay? So it's not an investment. Just build up your emergency fund, uh, even if it's just three months. I mean, I, as you know, I like to have 12 months, but three months is absolutely fine. Um, I wouldn't be buying insurance again. I'm not sure you can buy insurance for that, but I would. I would be... The thing about having the cash is it causes a psychological change in you, uh, Peter. It causes you to feel that you're in control, that you're on the front foot. And here's the thing. When you have an adequate emergency fund, it's not about the return or anything and keep it in just cash. It, it enables you to take more risks for you to take that new job or take a pay cut to learn more and hopefully have a bonus. It gives you more options. So um, I would always be building the reserves myself because of the, the change it gives me. Um, mentally right come on let's have a look what we got how long did it let's have a look here any others we got um okay let's have a look here what was the other one we got here whoops sorry let me just have a look um who someone said who 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 inspired me let's have a look who inspires you financially and why uh financially um in a financial sense the person who did inspire me the most in my life um was a wonderful man called david norton and he was a financial planner he was 54, um, sadly, when he died of a brain tumour. But he mentored me when I was a young financial planner. I, I became a certified financial planner in 1998, before anyone had heard about qualifications. And he was so giving and so lovely. And I also hired him, cost me 5,000 quid, which is about 15 grand now, for him to work with me and my wife Jane for the year to develop our financial plan. And that's how I ended up hitting my milestones when I was 50, because they were things that he helped me work out. And he was just so... He was so, um, uh, how can I put it? He was so, um, he was just nice to be around, you know? He made you feel, he made you a better person just you being in his company. And he always said to me, um, just focus on being the best version of you. Don't let money control you. And um, you'll figure it all out. You're a bright guy, Jason. You can do this. And that's my message to you, really, as we can sort of come, unless there are any more questions. Um, basically, um, you've got everything you need in your hands and you've got all the abilities and skills you need so uh, I'll come back to that in a minute there's another question here from Peter just before we finish up let's have a look um, oh should you get income protection insurance and an emergency uh, rather than an emergency fund or both no first and foremost Peter you build your emergency fund which as I say first you get your thousand quid together then you get your rid of your debt and then you build your three three uh at least three months core living costs i have 12 months as you know but you have three then you want income protection for kicking in most income protection kicks in after three months i've got income protection policy which kicks in after three months um 100 quid a month gives me forty thousand quid a year tax free if i cannot work due to illness or disability for more than three months so it dovetails it's the emergency fund dovetails will be income protection insurance hopefully that clarifies it there um Oh, look, another question here. Um, I'll answer these because as they're coming in, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i go a little longer than the 30 minutes if you want, if there's still questions, and then I'll come to a close. So this is uh, Bed Z. Um, Hi, Jason. Would you still be able to use the 25% government contributor to the LISA if you're buying your first home but you don't have to use your money for a deposit due to right to buy scheme? Um, right, so the question is, is if you don't use your LISA, your lifetime ISA, on which you've received a 25% government bonus on your contribution, if you don't use it to buy your first home, you can never use it to buy a property, okay? You can't use it towards a deposit. If you've bought your first home by using one of the other schemes, like the government equity deposit or whatever, right to buy scheme or help to buy scheme, then you have to, in order to keep the uh, deposit, uh, the government contribution to your LISA, you've got to wait until you're 60, OK, that's what the current rules say. You can take the money out earlier, but the government penalty is such that they'll have back their 25 percent and a little bit more. So hopefully that um, hopefully that explains that, Bedsy. If I've not clarified that to you properly, then then let me know. Um, OK, well, look, unless there are any more questions, I'm going to wrap up. Um, um, oh, look, we've got still more people joining thick and fast. So 
here's the thing. Um, 2020 has been a mad year, right? And you'll either be looking back and saying, God, you know, what happened to me there? What, 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 you know, God. And you may or may not have your never again moment. You know, I never want to ever be in that situation of, you know, in between jobs or not having cash or being paying payments or feeling stupid or feeling embarrassed or feeling vulnerable. Or you might be thinking, God, that was a great year. I made lots of money. I did really wise things. I really got ahead. I paid down debt. I got out of a bad relationship. I got out of a bad business deal. I changed job. Whatever it is, celebrate the successes acknowledge and learn from the failures and the missteps and the thing about next year 2021 you can win with money if you do not let money define your happiness that's so and it's easy for me to say i don't have any debt and i you know i've got a head and stuff but i know what it's like when you're still walking up that hill don't think about getting to the summit just focus on taking one step at a time being very intentional and keep saying to yourself is is my what is what i'm going to do today with my money is this getting me nearer or further away from my idea of a life filled with fulfillment, joy, happiness, great relationships and a sense of um, um, that you your life matters and your life does matter. And money is merely your servant, not your master. Thank you, everyone, for um, your support this year. It's been great hanging out with you. Um, if you love what I do, tell everyone else. I hope to see you on another live. You know you can always ask me questions and get in touch with me on jason-butler.com. Check out the resources there. We've got a new podcast uh, this week. You're going to love this with Stacey Lohman, um, absolutely inspirational uh, lady. That comes out tomorrow. So check that out, Real Money Stories podcast. I know you're going to love it. She's 34. The lady has redefined what it means to live a good life and the role of money in it. It's been great seeing you. Um, see you all next year. Have a great Christmas. And here's to an even better 2021. Bye, everyone.